on this edition of Independent Sources, Grace Under Fire. A relatively unknown Queen's Assemblywoman raises questions by running only on her first name. Ethnic Media Milestone. The award ceremony recognizing excellence in ethnic media marks its 10th anniversary. And Doomsday Deferred. A Mayan choreographer uses dance to debunk myths about the end of the world. Welcome to Independent Sources. I'm Zyphus Lebron. And I'm Diana Ravinka. Assemblywoman Grace Meng is causing a few political insiders to scratch their heads. The Queen's Democrat has decided to run her newly mounted congressional campaign on her name recognition alone, her first name, that is. For the last month, many of her campaign signs and placards have simply read Grace and then Democrat for Congress. It's a strategy some insiders believe is doomed to fail because she may not be extremely popular outside of the Chinese and immigrant communities. On the other hand, there are some who believe she's running as an ethnically ambiguous candidate in order to attract the wider community. Whatever her reasons, the Assemblywoman seems in for a turbulent time. There have already been salvos between candidates who've accused each other of trying to split the vote along ethnic lines. I spoke with two journalists about the issue, Joe Wei of the Chinese paper The World Journal and Shane Dixon Kavanaugh of Cranes, New York. Shane, describe the ethnic makeup of the newly re redrawn district and who else is running aside from Grace Meng? Well, in addition to Grace Ming, we have a couple of other uh, fairly strong contenders in the race, a city councilwoman by the name of Elizabeth Crowley. Um, who is actually the cousin of Joe Crowley, who is the head of the Queens County Democratic Party, which has actually endorsed Grace Ming. The other person we have running in the race is Rory Lanceman. Now, the newly drawn 6th Congressional District in Queens is a almost a primarily Asian district. About 40% of the people living there are now of Asian descent. However, it's a large sweeping district that goes from about Bayside all the way down to, you know, Woodhaven and Ridgewood, and it encompasses a lot of other uh, uh, enclaves, including a lot of white working class uh, voters. Joe, Grace Meng uh, has a last name that is uh, very recognized within the Asian community. Uh, it's a name that, that is very well recognized politically. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us who Grace Meng is? Well, she, she's, first of all, she's a lawyer. She's a mother. I have uh, kids, and her husband is a uh, Korean-American. And uh, she was the do she is the daughter of a uh, former assembly um, man, uh, Jimmy Meng. Her father worked about well, just one turn because of health reason she uh, he retired, and Grace Mann picked up the the, uh, the vacancy of his fa of her father, and run for the, uh, the I believe this is the first turn, and I think people like Grace Mann because she being all of work all of her community, and not only the Chinese American community I think the Korean American community and Indian and Pakistan community over there in the Queens, in the, in the northern Queens area. So it's quite popular and very, very uh, beloved by the uh, by the all the people within the Asian community, and I think that will be, I think the people are very excited this time because this is going to be the first time we have an Asian American uh, plus as a woman uh, will be probably will be the uh, congressman from Queens, so even from the whole New York State, so there will be major history moved on. So we are. I think the whole community is working up to gear up to help to, to get elected, or first of all, to get the primary about June 23rd, I believe. June 26th. June 26th, yes. Uh -huh. Shane, in your article, you've uh, quoted insiders saying that uh, running without the last name is an unusual omission. Elaborate on that. Well, uh, especially in a congressional race uh, for a primary election, this race is going to be June 26th. It's likely going to be a very low turnout election. And outside of uh, uh, Assemblywoman Meng's base in Flushing, she's not really well known outside of the, the district. And this is sort of unprecedented in that uh, it's very strange that somebody would be running uh, for Congress, not well known outside of a small part of the district, without using their last name. She's not known to people in 
um, you know, in Ridgewood necessarily, or Maspeth, or you know, neighborhoods outside of Flushing. So the fact that her last name isn't part of her campaign literature has really sort of raised some eyebrows, certainly. And be specific in the reactions that you've been hearing from insiders. Uh, what are the reasons that they are speculating on? Well, folks have speculated that because you know Grace Ming is Chinese American, that uh, being a Chinese American woman running in this race, running in a Democratic primary where, where a lot of the people who are likely to vote are white. And they're also, you know, conservative-leaning Democrats. These aren't uh, progressive Democrats that you're going to see on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, for instance. And quite frankly, it really sort of shows the fact that, I mean, race and ethnicity still play a major role in elections in New York City. Joe, um, what are the reactions within the Asian community to Grace Meng running without mention of uh, her last name? Well, you know, since we're running on the uh, English at the Grace for Congress, most of the Asian community doesn't really pay attention to the English advertise. So there's an Asian to Asian um, advertisement as well. Yeah, there's a Chinese, there's a Korean, all kind of uh, languages advertisement over there. Is she using her last name in those? Oh yes, yes, that that would be obvious. Otherwise, you can just say Zhao Wen. Her her Chinese name will be Meng. Zhao Wen Meng is going to be the first name, a uh, last name, and Zhao Wen will be the first name. So there's no question, no people gonna doubt whether she hire her f uh, last name. So Meng Zhao Wen running for Congress in Chinese-speaking community, that's okay, that's fine. I believe the same thing in the Korean community, too. Uh, as far as the English advertising, I think from our community, we don't really read that, you know, English signs. But I, I would think that's the in part of uh, as a strategy because, as uh, he just mentioned, the, the outside of our community, uh, Grace Meng is very, very last known person. I think part of the strategy, without using the uh, last name, is to try to generate generate a conversation within the uh, within the voters over there. So maybe we'll talk about who is this Grace, and they they have to put together Grace. And when they saw her, when they saw her, when you see her, this is an Asian uh, Asian American. They're gonna put the things together. Whether this part of the strategy can can really achieve their 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 purpose in terms of winning the voter, uh, we will see. But um, on the other hand, their official statement is because the Grace is a very nice sounds name and can put a very uh, elegant flavor into this whole campaign. But we will see whether, the, without using the last name in English advertising, whether generate any backfire at all. Yeah. An, an elegant flavor to the campaign. Uh, what about uh, Grace making reference? And any, does it have any religious uh, connotations uh, within a district that is rife with conservatives? Any talk about that? No, I think, um, I mean, even Joe Crowley, the head of the Queen, Queens County Democratic Organization, when he endorsed Grace Ming, I mean, he said, I mean, it's part of their campaign slogan, you know, Washington could use a little more Grace so to speak. So, I mean, that's the way in which they've kind of spun this is that, I mean, that's part of their campaign slogan to a certain extent. But even still, it is very, I mean, it's very noticeable. I mean, people say it's conspicuously absent that she's not including her last name. And it's just also important to note that, I mean, in this race, uh, in this congressional race, race and ethnicity is, you know, is playing a major role. For instance, Rory Lantzman, who is the uh, declared Jewish candidate in the campaign, has been very critical of another possible Jewish candidate entering the race because they think this is a tactic by the Queens County Democratic Organization to split the Jewish vote. So again, I mean, ethnicity and race is going to be a key factor in this campaign. Yeah, I think he's right. Actually, matter of fact, there's another gentleman, uh, very veteran uh, uh, po uh, politics within the Queens community, by the name Jeffrey Godlet. Yeah, yeah. Godlet. He he announced his uh, his candidacy. Right, and this has yes. caused a lot of concern with the Lanceman campaign yes. again mm -hmm. because Jewish voters in the district are probably going to vote for the Jewish candidate. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the Asian voters voting for the Asian candidate. And Crowley, who is a, you know identifies herself as you know a you know white ethnic Irish woman from you know from Glendale. Yes. Same thing. I mean, so again, race she and ethnicity. She's going to take some uh, Catholics and white votes mm -hmm. out of this race, and if the uh, uh, Jewish votes get split or divided. Right. I think that would be probably good for Grace, though. 
we've reached out to Grace Meng's campaign and we asked for a comment you know, in uh, reference to her using only her, the, her last name and we have not gotten a comment back. Shane, have you met any sort of uh, resistance or have they been quiet in, with you when you were writing the article? Have you tried to, to, to reach out and, I mean, and ask? Uh, no, of course I've reached out to the campaign and I mean they've, they, you know, and it certainly is the right, they said, you know, this is an issue that we're really not going to address or discuss because they don't, they, at the end of the day, believe that it doesn't serve them well to make this more of an issue than it's already been made. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, again, if you want like the official response from the campaign, it was, as Joe Crowley said, when he endorsed Grace Ming, we could all use a little more grace in Congress. But I mean, that's the best that they've offered so far on the record. On that note, thank you both for being <laughs> with us in studio today. Shane Dixon Kavanaugh and Joe Way. Thank, thank you. you so much. Good. Thank you. When we come back, the city's ethnic and community media are celebrated for their outstanding work. Before that, Abby Shola has some other news. Thanks, Vianora. Here's a look at some headlines from the ethnic media. From The Independent, several studies show that sex workers are more vulnerable to being killed in their line of work than others. FBI data from 2012 shows that sex workers are 40 times more likely to die from something other than natural causes. The American Journal of Epidemiology found that an average of 124 sex workers were killed annually between 1981 to 1990. In 2003, the Urban Justice Center completed an analysis of street-based prostitution in New York City. That study revealed that many sex workers are reluctant to report being attacked because many have been assaulted by police. LDRL La Prenza recently sat down with criminal lawyer Deanna Rodriguez to discuss the city's rising gang population. Rodriguez, who heads the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office Gang Unit, says there isn't a single area in the city that isn't somehow affected by gangs. This includes affluent communities where children from wealthy homes are also joining gangs. Rodriguez also says Latino gangs are the most violent, including the Mexican gang called Niños Malos and the Dominican Los Trinitarios. Rodriguez believes the rise in gangs comes as a result of the economic crisis that has led to several youth programs in the city being cut. From the Amsterdam News, a new study finds that African Americans are being discriminated against when filing for bankruptcy. The study written by law professor and bankruptcy expert Robert M. Lawless finds that attorneys are advising more African Americans to file for the more expensive Chapter 13 bankruptcy, which requires the debtor to pay a significant portion of their debt. This while whites with similar financial problems are being encouraged to file for Chapter 7, in which consumer debts are written off completely. William Brewer, president of the National Association of Consumer Bankruptcy Attorneys in Washington, D.C., says they believe in fair play and will work on changing the disparity if further research proves that there is a discrepancy. The Brooklyn Bureau reports that a group of Sunset Park residents inspired by Occupy Wall Street have formed an activist group to fight for more localized issues. A representative from the group says they feel the Occupy movement didn't reflect the diversity of the city, especially people of color. The Sunset Park group will address issues such as education, funding cuts for after-school programs, and expanding funding to schools in the area. And finally, from the forward, a 43-year-old Jewish developer is making plans to bring observant Jews back to the Lower East Side. Michael Bola, a managing director at Prudential, plans to save Israel wholesale and retail Judaica. The store is a 60-year-old establishment in the area that specializes in Jewish religious paraphernalia and artifacts. The store is one of the last remaining remnants of the observant Jewish community that once dominated the area. But the owner, Heidi Youssef, says business has been rocky for years. Bola currently owns a high-end condo in the area that is designed to lure the community back through kosher food and a pool with single-sex swimming times. He plans to spend $100,000 to renovate Youssef's store and reopen it as an Israel-made craft shop and possibly a kosher coffee bar. Those were just a few headlines from the ethnic media. Back to Zyphus and Vianora. Thanks, Abby. The EP's awards hit a milestone last week when they marked their 10th year of existence. The awards are given for outstanding reporting by the city's ethnic immigrant and community media. It was a night of music and merriment, plaques and platitudes at the 10th annual EP's awards. 
The ceremony was held at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. The school's dean, Steve Shepard, spoke about the sector's importance in a city where four out of ten residents are born outside of the United States. Reflecting our city's rich diversity, there are more than 350 daily and weekly newspapers, magazines, broadcast stations, and websites to serve these important communities in dozens and dozens of languages. The event marked the first time the awards were distributed through the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. The IPIs were started by the now defunct New York Community Media Alliance. Errol Lewis was the night's master of ceremonies. He reminisced about his own start in the community media after turning down a job at the Wall Street Journal and the significance of continuing to have the awards show. This is a very special ceremony because we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of these awards. It is the only award that exclusively recognizes the achievements of New York's independent ethnic and community media. It is also the first time that the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism has been the host. The journalism school is privileged to pick up the torch passed to it by the New York Community Media Alliance and is going to be building on the very important work of that organization. Connie Chung delivered the keynote address where she encouraged those present to continue to be a voice for diversity. She, however, cautioned those attending to remain unbiased in a media landscape that she described as becoming increasingly negative. Your communities want to know about these stories. They want more details, and mainstream media is not doing it. Now, I caution you, if I may, insert myself into this advice that I'm, or commendation that I'm giving you, and that is to say that I don't encourage you to incite, to, to say, you know, this should be in the news more because I find, I believe, that there's too much opinion, too much um, uh, negativism in this country, that it needs to be just reporting. Ten first place awards were given out on this 10th anniversary in various categories, including Best Investigative or In-Depth Story, Best Article on Immigration or Social Justice, Best Editorial or Commentary, Best Overall Print Publication, Best Overall Design of an Online Publication, Best Photo Essay or Online Slideshow, Best Photograph, Best Video, Best Audio, and Best Multimedia Package. A full list of the winners is available on the website voicesofnewyork.org. Do your part. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank today. This is Immigrant Heritage Week in New York City. The commemoration was created nine years ago by Mayor Michael Bloomberg and is overseen by the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. The week of activities celebrates the city's diverse immigrant communities. This year, five films shown throughout the five boroughs will mark the celebration. We caught up with the city's Commissioner of Immigrant Affairs, Fatima Shama, who told us some more about the films and the festivities. Immigrant Heritage Week in New York will always be around April 17th because in 1902, the greatest number of immigrants were processed through Ellis Island on April 17th. And so it's a pretty remarkable day in New York City history. The first film that we're launching is a film called The Apple Pushers. It's a film that really marks the um, story and amazing success, if you will, um, or strive more than anything, of immigrant street vendors, um, immigrant entrepreneurs who actually respond to New York City's um, healthy food crisis. And so it is a remarkable film that tells a story of how New York City um, and the mayor responded to the lack of healthy fruits and vegetables by creating uh, green cart vendor licenses. And, these, and the story is about five um, immigrants who take these uh, licenses and really um, literally push fresh fruit and vegetables like apples into our communities. All of these immigrants are starting their lives over again in America, seizing the classic American opportunity. Uh, the second is a, a film called Welcome to Shelbyville. It's a story about um, Somali immigrants were resettled in uh, a small town in Tennessee and sort of the reaction of the community but the overcoming reality of how Americans welcome their neighbors, their immigrant neighbors. God has appointed 
some of these Somalian people for salvation. They don't care about the ones that were born and raised here. They much rather take care of them instead of us. There's a lot of people in this town that are fed up. It is their culture, it's their way of life that we're being forced to comply with. Another film is a film about citizenship, Citizen USA, and it's a film that documents a trip around uh, the 50 states and the journey of why someone becomes an American. My favorite thing about America is the 911. They come right away for your rescue. The right to practice any religion I want. So what are you going to do to celebrate becoming a citizen? I'm going to put a U.S. flag on my door. Another film is Not in Our Town, Light in the Darkness, that channels the, and really tells the story of um, the anti-immigrant hate crime in Patchogue, Long Island. The detective came over to my house and told me, listen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your brother got killed last night. And I'm, I'm the first thing I take my cell phone and I call him. The last film will end at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, um, and it's called No Look Pass, and it's about a Burmese immigrant um, and her journey in uh, university. I've told my parents that I've wanted to play professional basketball overseas since I was little. Girl, have to be stay home and taking care of your house. She wants to find me a rich husband. Yeah, I think you're very traditional. Your Burmese culture is different than America. Yes. Very delighted because in the city of New York, Immigrant Heritage Week has become a footprint. And so there are events around the city with us that we know of, that we don't know of. Um, there are moments that we get to celebrate people. So another opportunity for us is during Immigrant Heritage Week where we um, announce five winners of the American Dreamer Awards, an award that we established to really recognize the contributions of five individuals or organizations towards immigrants in New York. I have to say that in my experience and in all that I can imagine, um, immigrants will continue to be the absolute lifeblood of the city, the em economic lifeblood, the cultural lifeblood, the social lifeblood. Demographically speaking, we are growing in size and number. Um, to me, it is the beauty of who we are as New Yorkers um, and all that we should celebrate. Anyone interested in seeing the films can log on to the city's website, www.nyc.gov, for more details. We'll be right back. And finally from us tonight, the English poet T.S. Eliot once wrote that the world would end in a whimper, not a bang. Of course, Hollywood has long offered a different scenario of the planet's final moments. And lately, the end forecasted by the Mayan calendar has doomsday prophets and even regular folks predicting that the end is near and that the planet may be teetering on a cataclysm of biblical proportions. But one Mayan choreographer is saying the sky is not falling. As we hear in this report from Marlene Peralta, we may be in for an awakening, but not a rude one. The Mayans knew about it. The Bible. This is the way the world ends in 2012, according to Hollywood's interpretation of some Mayan prophecies. However, the truth is that civilization may not be drowned by giant waves or swallowed by a gaping hole in the earth. According to the Mayans, this is the fifth time that the world has that change. And what is scary for many people is that there is a ray that it, it comes from the center of the universe that it goes directly to the sun and, and goes directly to the Shivalba. The Shivalba in the Mayan world represents the dead. 
Javier Sul grew up in a Mayan civilization in the deep jungles of Veracruz, Mexico. He is one of the only Mayan indigenous choreographers in the world who's using dance to illustrate the 2012 Mayan prophecies. I always use in my, in my choreography Mayan elements, and this time, actually, my brother told me, you, you know, you should do something about the, the end of the Mayan calendar because people are saying that the world's going to end, and we know as Mayans that that's not the way we see it. What the Mayans do see, according to Sul, is a new beginning at the end of their calendar in 2012, hence the name of his latest performance. In Mayan culture, there is the idea that when you are a king, you have the capacity to transform your body. And when you're a priest, you have even more capacity to transform your body into gods, um, animals, into things on the underworld. So you learn since very young how to do that with your body, so you are able to make of your body energy and, and, and magic. That energy and magic is shown through his acrobatic moves and the use of a ribbon rope to transform his body into what he describes as airborne forces of nature and the earth. One such force is the Mayan god represented as a feather serpent. I can find that, that people understand that primitive part of it, but at the same time, because I dance with companies that uh, give me the knowledge of the aesthetic, that we see in dance, it helped me to kind of put it in a way that you can see both. You can see the, the, the primal movement, the raw movement, and you can see the beautiful movement with technique and, and acrobacy. He's been part of many recognized dance companies ever since, including Ballet Nacional of Cuba. I have the opportunity to be trained for the best dancers in Cuba. And then I just came out of Cuba for a year and came to the same place in Mexico. And then Martha Graham, the company, was teaching there. And they say, oh, come to New York. We give you a scholarship to take a workshop. Came to New York and stay forever. It has been 20 years since he arrived in New York performing this form of dance he uses to teach the world about his Mayan ancestry and the rituals that have been part of one of the greatest civilizations is still present in America. Marlene Peralta for Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. Till the next time, be independent-minded.